We are joined by Professor Natalia Trianova. So the format of today's talk will be an introduction from Dr. Natalia. She'll tell us about where she came from, what it's really taken to get where she is at the moment. And then we'll have quite a lengthy Q&A session. With no further ado, welcome Dr. Natalia, thank you. Hi everybody. So nice to see you all here. Um, and everybody on Zoom, hi. Um, I am the Graham Clark orator, which means um, I got invited to deliver this big lecture that was in the convention center. And the most important part of that is I got to meet so many interesting people and also so many aspiring researchers and people who are looking to contribute to technology, also in the clinic and elsewhere in society. So. It has been a personal, amazing journey for me. I had the oration on Tuesday. Now, I come from the US, I flew in on Sunday, um, terrible jet lag, it's 14 hours difference. Um, so, you know, the oration was on Tuesday, so I had to kind of, you know, make sure I can perform. But um, we had a very large STEM lunch for all women um, interesting in building relationships, in between women in STEM, but also promoting STEM fields. And then I had the oration, and then I have be, been meeting with sponsors. I, Justin was at the uh, breakfast with the sponsors yesterday, and today I have been meeting with different groups of people, with researchers today at the St. Vincent Hospitals. And now you are here, which is the best of all, right? <laughs> because how could I, how does one influence, have a mark on society? through you. This is the only way, right? If I can affect your life in the tiniest little way, then I've done my, you know, my mark on this earth, right? So that's why this event is so dear to my heart. I love doing that. And uh, so I will talk about, tell you what I do and uh, where I came from, what is your, my pathway. But the most important thing is for you to just grill me or whatever you want to ask me. I am very informal. Anything you know you want to ask me, I will um, try to answer it. So um, I come from Johns Hopkins University. Now I'm going to correct Justin, who called him John Hops Hopkins. Uh, it's Johns Hopkins. It's a very unusual name. Who has first name called Johns? I don't know what his mother was thinking, but. Um, this is a very famous university in the US, Johns Hopkins. It's a private university and it's the most famous medical university. Sort of, it has a, a very large undergraduate program and a graduate program, but also the medical school is extremely famous because it, a lot of research um, discoveries have been there. It's one of the premier hospitals in the country. So I'm very privileged in a way to be coming from there because I get to work you know, I'm an engineer, actually by education, I'm a physicist, but then I did biomedical engineering and probably I'll get to that. But I wanted to tell you is that I work at this intersection between engineering and um, bringing, you know, these approaches in the clinical practice. And I feel, you know, I, I, I'm in the right place to do that, if you will, because of this like amazing uh, medical school that is very open to research and open to new ideas and also a premier engineering school. So that's, that's uh, I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So Department of Biomedical Engineering, um, but it's a, it's a very broad field, biomedical engineering, and you might be familiar with, with it or not. It's basically anything. So, so there are two terms, and one is bioengineering, and the other is biomedical engineering. There are departments in the US that the bioengineering and departments that the biomedical engineering. The biomedical is more focused, not completely, but it has a slightly more focused on the device and, and bringing approaches that help patients. And the bioengineering is more understanding functioning of biological tissue and biotechnology. So if you, in your careers, if you're looking at to applying at places and you want to parse out the meaning of these words, that's what it means. So I'm in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. And the biomedical engineering is a field, it was not, you know, it started maybe, I don't know, 30 years ago. It's not a very, 
It's a fairly new discipline. Um, Johns Hopkins, my department, was the first department. It started out of the medical school, as a medical school department, and then it grew into the engineering school. Um, but it's been, it, the institution supports excellence so much. So my department has been number one in the US ever since inception. And we are very, how shall I put it, sort of vigilantly guard our place in that ladder. So we make sure we remain number one. So it is a lot of innovation and opportunity and freedom for students to explore whatever they want to explore in research um, in general. And this um, link to the medical school allows them to do research projects from like day one when they come as undergraduates in the medical school. And so it's a very fertile environment for, um, you know, new ideas and particularly for developing engineering approaches that can be used for patient health. So that's what is the overall picture of where I come from. Um, and I'll tell you what I do a little bit later, but let, you, let me tell you like a little bit about my personal story. I always feel like um, you link better, or you remember better sort of stories about science um, and, and success, if you will, when you can link to the beginnings of a certain career. Um, I have a very unusual pathway in my career because I am Bulgarian. I came from Bulgaria. I grew up in a communist country and I left the communist country to come to the US. So I didn't have much choices. I didn't have much information. I had nothing. Basically, I knew very little about what am I throwing myself in. I uh, So I... Um, I really wanted to do physics when I was back in Bulgaria because that seemed to me the field, you know, for the lack of other disciplines, the field that was most applicable to the field that's least abstract, but it had a lot of technical knowledge, like math would be more abstract, but physics would allow me to do more sort of a object or systems or something like that. And um, um, I really, I really liked technical stuff, like from very early age. I had like a book when I was three years old that was about rockets and propulsion. And it was awesome to, to be read by my dad before I went to bed, you know, how the rockets function at that time. It was like the competition between the Soviet Union and the West and who sends the, you know, the first rockets. Oh my God, it was so incredible. And uh, so I really knew I want to be um, a physicist when I, when I grow up. But things, of course, change. And, you know, so I, I did um, undergraduate in physics, but I became more and more interested in not you know, I, I felt that physics, when you apply physics um, in a lot of aspects of our material world, um, there is more certainty to it. And I felt that, let's say, biological tissue or um, anything that has to do with physiologic, physiology or animal organisms or, or human beings, they also, there are certain laws of physics that also can be applied there. So the way I would say that, for instance, um, you know, our muscles contract. Well, that is a contraction. It's a mechanical process. You have electrical signals, your nerves conduct electrical signals. So there are lo laws of mechanics and laws of electricity that apply to biological tissues and to our human body. And I very much like that. I like that application of physics. And But I was in Bulgaria and I, um, you know, I I did so the choices were not you know I didn't have my choice I didn't have a career or, or a counselor or any you know any pathway ahead of me um, but I um, well it's a long story so I shouldn't go into that but anyways I ended up getting a fellowship to the National Academy of Sciences in the US and uh, I was asked where would I like to go and I didn't know anything because at that time it was a closed society, so you cannot learn 
anything about what's going on in the US, absolutely anything. Actually, as a matter of fact, I would have been arrested if I would have gone to the American embassy. So you can do that. So um, my father, who is actually a very well-known scientist um, in a different discipline, would go um, to the US to, uh, for meetings. And one time he brought me a book by a very famous US researcher called Bioelectric Phenomena. And it hit the spot. It was in English. And it was the book about electricity in biological tissues, and particularly tissues that are called excitable, that generate their own electrical function. Those are nerves, skeletal muscle, the heart, and actually the gut of four excitable tissues. And so it was a book um, that described how the electrical signals are formed in the body, how they interact, and how they form these systems function, like how, for instance, the nerves transfer information when you step on a noxious stone, let's say how it goes to your brain and it goes down back to your muscles so you can lift your leg, right? These kinds of interesting things um, where electricity um, contributes to the bodily functions. And so I was very interested and I wanted to go work with the author, this famous guy. And um, so when they asked me where I wanted to go to the US, I ended up at Duke University, which is a also a very famous private university in the state of North Carolina. And they had also a very good biomedical engineering department. So I ended up there and there's a, um, I hadn't even yet defended my PhD. So, but um, yeah, so I started working there initially as a postdoctoral fellow. And then I was um, there for a while as a researcher. And um, after eight years, I think, I, um, so I was a researcher in what's called the research faculty. In other words, you, you sort of, I was even teaching classes, but I didn't have my own big lab. And um, then back in 95, no, 96, I um, got a position at Tulane University, another private university. It's in New Orleans a city that, that I absolutely love. So I ended up there and I skipped the assistant professor stage of my career. I went straight to associate professor. So in the US, the professorship positions are assistant, associate, and full professor. So I ended up being there an associate professor, started my lab, and was there. I was at Tulane for about 12 years. Um, and then I moved to Johns Hopkins University in 2006 in the summer and I don't think I've talked these days to anybody why I moved and what happened and what drove me to these things but when you look at my history it's actually it's full of very unusual stories like where I came from and how um, in a way when I came you know, I didn't know the language, I didn't have any mentors, I didn't have a pedigree, you know I didn't, so I had to find the entire academic career and all the successes that I have achieved, they are very much, right, I don't want to say my own, but they're like felt through very hard labor. They, they came out of a, a very hard labor and not just, it, the labor is not the important part. The important part, I always think about myself, what, what made me so successful is the fact that I just, all the rejections never stopped me. You know, you just learn how to take rejections, how to take the gut punch and how to get up and go again and continue your journey because you have a goal and you know you want to achieve that goal. So this has been immensely helpful for me in my own determination and steeliness and, and the drive to not get depressed or not despair when you nobody believes you what you're doing or you have nobody to turn to. So um, to get back to my chronological story, I was um, you know a professor at Tulane University, and um, I loved it there. And I don't know whether you know about the city of New Orleans. This is the cradle of jazz. It's a beautiful, wonderful city, and I so much loved living there. So. Um, the university was really good and um, but it wasn't it's not a very like famous research institution it's nothing like Hopkins and so in a way quickly I became kind of big fish in a small pond 
um, you know, I was very good and everything, but like, I think that there was no further ability for growth. And so, but I never thought I will leave, never. I just, I love the place so much. This is the most non-judgmental place on earth that I've ever been. Everybody is who they want to be. And so I loved living there. And uh, um, so you are really young, so you don't know um, about that time, but there was a major event in the US in 2005. It was a hurricane, it's called Katrina, that came, well, New Orleans, New Orleans gets a lot of hurricanes anyways, but that was a devastating category five that broke the levees of the city and flooded the city entirely. So it was, I'm getting goosebumps as I, I talk about that because this is probably the most tragic event in my life. My city was like, everybody, it was a mandatory evacuation. I was in a meeting in China at that time. I had gone to a meeting, my city flooded and there was no communications. Like I didn't know where my daughter was. I didn't know where anybody was. You just don't know whether you have a house. So events like this a major, um, so, the reason I'm telling you about that is because we couldn't return. The city was underwater, full underwater for three months. And um, so we lived somewhere else. It's a long story how we all assembled and found. I lived in Shanghai for a month un unwillingly because I had no place to go. And because I had to also have an appendectomy on top of everything else in, in Shanghai. So it was like not a good part of my life. But when I returned, then suddenly what happened, um, people realized that while I was so entrenched in my love for New Orleans and I didn't want to move anywhere, anyway, people suddenly thought that I might be movable. And so in this period between we returned from the hurricane and, you know, my university was closed. It was closed for nearly a year because, you know, the water got pumped out of the city and they started rebuilding. So there were no classes. Some of the classes were taught in other cities. All the universities in the U.S. accepted students from Tulane after that event. And um, um, so, you know, for me, I would go somewhere or give a talk somewhere and I, people would approach me suddenly and say, well, so are you movable and what do you think? So in 2000, the beginning of 2006, I ended up with six job offers without applying because people thought I might be movable and they like, maybe, you know, I, I would not have a future. Now, you know, because the city link was disconnected from me. And um, so again, at some point I was like interviewing nonstop and I had four real estate agents in four different cities. And um, I chose Johns Hopkins and I've never looked back. I had these long lists of what is the pros and cons, never looked back. It's been amazing journey. And my career ever moving ever since I moved there has taken like an exponential growth and um, you know our efforts have been very successful but you can see how torturous the journey to success can be and it's a lot of you know um, sort of um, odd things can can happen in life and things that like completely impede you the question is how do you find you know, a potential silver lining and how do you overcome and how do you go forward? So when I came to Johns Hopkins University, um, I really, it's again because of the medical school um, and I work in, I work in the cardiac field. So my, my research is on the electrical activity of the heart and particularly on heart rhythm disorders like arrhythmias, you know, when the heart doesn't, um, the electrical functioning of the heart is abnormal because the so the you have you know what an electrical you've seen a, what an ECG is you guys know what an ECG is so this it records the electrical functioning of the heart so in the heart we have an electrical wave that propagates through the heart in a very orderly fashion and it's recorded by this like the ECG which is really regular you have exactly the same interval that's your heartbeat right and you can imagine, and, and this serves as a trigger for the contraction. So when the electrical wave comes through the heart, your heart contracts and pumps blood. And that's the main function of the heart is to get blood to every part of your body. And you can imagine if something goes wrong with the electrical wave, what happens? 
if there is something wrong with the contraction, if there is something wrong with the contraction, blood cannot get to the place that it needs to go. So it's very dangerous, little. Um, so these are the um, electrical disorders in the heart are really um, a big issue um, in healthcare and actually cardiovascular disease and that leading to arrhythmias is one of the, it's the number one killer in the world. It, it has been for many, many decades. So it's a very important societal task is there to how to find a way to lower the death toll and, um, and, that, and the toll on the healthcare expenditure that this is, um, these diseases are inflicting. Um, so my, um, I work on the electrical functioning of the heart and particularly on heart rhythm disorders. And I look at these arrhythmias and an arrhythmia, as I said, it's, it's a disorder in the heart. So if you, if you have a patient with an arrhythmia and you're able to see what is happening with the electrical signal, it actually looks like a tornado on the heart. It goes like, psh, like this, and it can move around. And when it moves around, instead of having an orderly wave and then the, the heart contracts in a very synchronous way, instead of that, we have this sort of recirculating electrical wave going around, either sitting in a place or going around. And then the ECG doesn't look like the regular thing. It looks very chaotic. Um, so that's somebody who's suffering of little arrhythmia and they go, die in five to seven minutes if that happens. So when that hap when an electrical wave like that happens, disorder like that, what happens with the contraction, every place where the wave, um, the electrical signal comes, is trying to contract. As the electrical wave moves, it's doing like this, the contraction. It cannot be organized to pump the blood out. So it's going like this. So you can think it as a bag of worms. That's how it contracts in these little arrhythmias. So there is no blood actually pumped out. And um, so these are very, as I said, little disorders. So that's what we are working on, trying to predict um, these events, predict arrhythmias, diagnose them better, and also develop the best way to treat patients who have some of those arrhythmias. Uh, there is the, the arrhythmias, your heart has a lower and upper chambers. The lower are called the ventricles. The upper are called the atria, and the um, uh, arrhythmias in the ventricles are little. The arrhythmias in the atria are not, but they lead to stroke in the brain, blood, blood clot, also to heart failure. So patients die from them as well. So I work on these two different types of arrhythmia in the heart. Um, that's my research. And, um, you know, as I said, I'm an engineer and I, um, we use two main technologies for that to do our research and what we i call our research clinical translation which means it is directly focused on bringing it to the clinic to the patient bedside like to to use it in in real patients and we use two technologies um one is uh, basically creating personalized model of the patient's heart. We call it the digital twin. Do you guys know, for instance, how um, new planes are designed? They don't put the, the, um, the parts together. Somebody creates a model, right? Computational modeling is now ubiquitous in a lot of engineering disciplines, right? In civil engineering, bridges, uh, buildings, you create a model of it first or you know you optimize the functioning of the machine or or how the building is designed based on a model a computational model and that's what we do we build computational models of the functioning of the patient's heart the electrical functioning of the patient's heart we call it a digital twin of the heart um, and so in that model we it's a sort of a, a model that shows the different interactions between the cells because, as I said, you get this disorderly wave. Most frequently, the patients who get these arrhythmias will are patients who have had a previous heart attack. Um, heart attack is, so there are two different terms, heart attack and cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is a sudden cardiac death. This is one thing I'll talk about. Um, 
the um, infarction or heart attack is when the blood, you eat too many French fries or some other stuff and your uh, lifestyle and your artery gets blocked in the heart and it, blood cannot be delivered to the heart. It's not enough oxygen to the heart itself and it dies. Parts of it die and become scar like in a normal wound. That's what happens in the heart when you don't get when you get a blood vessel blocked. And so you get these, the scarring in the heart, you get these pieces of scar, and that's what causes the electrical wave to no longer be synchronous and propagating through the heart. So it kind of goes through the scar, bounces around, comes back, and that's how you get this chaotic movement. So patients who have heart attack get um, a lot of arrhythmias. And so uh, when we create these personalized models of patients' hearts, we start with the imaging like MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, particularly contrast and has, you guys know what an MRI is, you can, you have seen an, you know, patient being sort of going in, then you, if you have been in one, you go for like a long time. Um, and it basically take, takes a scan of the heart and on that scan, you can see where the scar is, okay? And so we use these images to reconstruct a model of the heart and we also populate it with cells like one of our personalized heart can have 10 million cells and so each of these cells gener generates an electrical signal and so what we do is like we give it a little stimulus here or there like you poke it or prod it a little bit you can do that in a flesh and blood heart or you can do it in a computer model right that's what is the benefit of a computer model or digital twin you can play scenarios you can see stuff that you cannot see in the clinic or in the you know the real if you're doing an animal or something and so we can see under what circumstances these arrhythmias originate and then we can um, figure out whether this patient has a risk of dying suddenly the risk of dying suddenly comes from the fact that the electrical wave will start doing this sort of recirculation right so not every scar causes that. In some cases, it might find a nice pathway to the scar. In others, it gets bounced around, and it's an arrhythmia. So we create these models for the patients, and we use them for two things in two different applications. One is to have diagnosis to predict whether they will die suddenly, and the other is to find the best way to treat the patient. And so, um, this technology digital twin building a computational model we also combine it with artificial intelligence because if you just build a computational model you may not incorporate all the clinical data that is available for the patient they've come to the hospital many times they have other clinical data their demographic data and lifestyle data is also important so we often combine our digital twins the simulations particularly the output of those with artificial intelligence to decide whether the patient will die of um, sudden cardiac death or whether they will have other um, change in their condition. So we want to do that to predict what's going to happen. And we also use our technologies, as I said, to um, tell the doctors how to best treat the patient in a really personalized way. And the way patients with arrhythmias are treated is they thread a catheter in the heart so it comes through the, the the vein in the groin the catheter comes up reaches the heart it's threaded down and then they deliver a radio frequency energy and burn pieces of the heart just burn them like really and this you burn the places where the perpetrators of the arrhythmia typically is between the scar if, for instance, there is some pathway that makes the, the wave bounce around, you want to burn that. But it's very difficult to figure out where to do that. And then so where, that's where we come and we figure out for these individual patients, based on the distribution of scar, based on how they function, the, the cells, we tell the clinicians where to execute this burning. Um, and so I have a clinical trial currently on that. Um, we are testing whether the standard clinical, the standard of care, which is what they do now in the hospital, and our approach, which is better. We have a randomized clinical trial, which means the patient doesn't know 
um, we, you know, what we do the simulations, we don't know whether the patient will have one or the other procedure. So we are enrolling 160 patients to test our technology, which is actually an, a really amazing thing because I'm an engineer and I lead a clinical trial, you know, so this is like the crossing over the way we were able to connect with medicine and be part of the treatment of patients. So this is a, a, an achievement that I'm really very proud of. Um, and so those are the, the big things that we are working on that I spoke at the oration, uh, where we are going with that. And um, it is very interesting that the clinical team is very um, embedded with us. We have worked together in these new approaches and there is a lot of trust and acceptance which has taken me a long time to develop, but it's an awesome situation right now. We all have these new innovation and discoveries and uh, these new ways to predict patient trajectory or to predict how to treat the patient. So this is pretty much, I'm gonna shut up now <laughs> and I will let you guys um, ask any questions. I hope this was interesting to you. This is sort of my own personal story and research. Wow, thank you so much. Can I have a round of applause for Dr. Chakrita? And another round of applause because she's timed 30 minutes uh, down to 28 minutes without looking at a clock, uh, which runs right to schedule early, in fact, um, that I'm certainly impressed by. We have, thank you, thank you. We have a whole flood of questions coming in for you. So this isn't the most upvoted one, but one you might enjoy the most. Uh, where did you get your pants? <laughs> so uh -huh. you yes, yes, yes. Um, Norway. I was on a trip in Norway in June. Aren't they cool? They're cool. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone's going to Norway, <laughs> get a nice souvenir. <laughs> okay. the, the most upvoted question is, which fields of science do you think will have the greatest importance in the near future? But I think I'll expand that to be fields of science and also fields of technology that you're more familiar with or that you work in? Um, well, I'll have to list two. Um, probably computer science, particularly I'm talking about artificial intelligence. I think this will have a huge impact, really. And I also think biomedical engineering will continue, or biomedicine will continue to have massive impact. And these things are not separated because you know, computer science and data science doesn't necessarily focus only on medical problems. On the contrary, they have so many other stuff. But that, that I think, will be a revolution in medicine, and it will come from the merger of all the, you know, data science and artificial intelligence developments, and um, bringing that to the clinic, to clinical decision making. I think that there will be a disruptive um, process and a revolution in that. I think that's that's my expectation. I might be biased, so. <laughs> we welcome your bias. Um, you've spoken about being able to take punches in the gut and keeping on going. And this question asks, how you stay encouraged in the face of these hurdles uh, with mistakes that may happen, unsuccessful applications, um, when people don't believe in what you're doing and doubt you, uh, how do you keep going at those times? Um, it's a... Uh... I always would say to myself, if somebody puts me down or doesn't believe in anything that I do, I would say, I don't, I normally tell myself, I will show you. And it's not that I will do something to like address them or anything, but the determination to do work in such a way that it's better what they are doing or demonstrating that what I believed in, it's actually really going to become a reality. I really, so to take a step back and say, I have a very strong determination and believe in what I do. I think that this is my North Star. This is my, that's what we say in America, my guiding sort of star. It's I'm very laser focused on my goal. I have been all my life. I wanted to do, I wanted to do engineering in medicine. I wanted to do personalized medicine via computation, um, via um, other engineering methodologies. And I've always been, focused on that. People didn't believe I was too early in many ways. They just like, oh, so then you figure out how to sort of show small parts, but keep the big goal and you'll get there. I mean, I got there. I got there against all odds. And, and that has been really um, a powerful experience. 
So you turn the, the doubt into fuel to keep you going. Um, you, I turned other people's doubt into my fuel. <laughs> Sorry, that's what I meant. Yes, yes. I I didn't have. I honestly, it, but it's actually a a good point because do you have self doubt to where you're going? I never did. I didn't. I might have self doubt whether this is the right thing currently I'm doing in some smaller part, but I never had a doubt in where I want to go. It just I I kept that straight. So um, yeah. Thanks for correcting me. And I'll jump. No, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, Jesse. No, I'm glad you did. Uh, several people would like to know what the most valuable experience has been for you, if you could choose just one. Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, it, it, <laughs> I'm re many people have asked me that question I, or, or a form of that question, and I will repeat the same thing. It is ability to deal with rejection. And I have told everybody who's been probably just in his head four times. I had in my lab when everybody, everything gets rejection, rejected, whatever got rejected, everything got rejected. We were like, it was terrible. And so it was so depressing. So we created the wall of shame and we would paste it on the wall. Everything that gets rejected, it's in the wall in my lab. So you can look at it every day. And then what that helps you do is you internalize the fact Okay, I'm facing it. I'm not hiding from it. I'm facing it. I know what that happened. I can't allow that to be depressing anymore, you know? And so to me, this, to me, rejection has been a great mentor. It's a terrible thing to say, but in my personal way, in my personal journey, that has been dealing with rejection, not just rejection itself, that's terrible, but dealing with rejection is the most valuable experience. I think that's some, certainly something that we can all learn from um, going forwards in our lives. So another question is, and it could be a tricky one, so I'll expand on it a little. What would be another country or place you'd like to work in? But I know you've spoken about how much you enjoy Johns Hopkins. So maybe what is it about Johns Hopkins that makes it so good? Um, so it isn't, so it, it, I'll, I'll broaden it a little bit. Um, I. I when I came um, to the US, I really wanted to work in the US and I'll tell you why. And I, so United States is a very, very big country with a lot of different, it's like different countries in it. It has so many different problems and so many, um, you know, different parts of it that have different political or other um, structures. And so it's a very diverse country in a way. But one thing that I really loved and will continue to love, and it's the reason that I work in the US, is the sense of meritocracy. Or not just the sense, but the experience of meritocracy. So, um, for instance, if you want to be promoted, you know, how do you get promotion in your department or in your career? When I was, you know, uh, visited Europe and European universities many, many times. And there, the head of the department has to retire or die off so people can move up. That's the structure. You know, you cannot, you can be very good, but you got to wait your turn. None of that exists in the US. So in my department, if everybody is good, everybody can become a full professor. And you can have a department of full professors. You know, mm. why not? I mean, they're good. So that sense of that doesn't mean that there isn't a sexist part and a racist part and all. I'm not. I'm not diminishing that. But in general, it is a meritocracy in academia. I found that very important because of where I come from: a foreigner, a woman, no pedigree, no experience, no mentor. So you want to be in a place that has promotion, that um, where you can achieve success despite that not wait in line on your life without being recognized. So that's why I work in America. I am not well familiar I, with Australian system. I have to say that. So I can't judge, um, but meritocracy is very important to me. And then Johns Hopkins, I talked about that. Really, to me, how important is the excellence of my department and the fact that we have such a good link with the School of Medicine. Most importantly, that the medicine 
appreciates the contribution of engineering. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, there are two questions that tie in together slightly, so I'll ask them at the same time. What do you think the most valuable skills are in your line of work? And also, from the perspective of a student, what can we be doing right now to get uh, in high school to get to where you are in your career? Ah, you know, um, well, I'm going to start with the second. I probably will forget the first, so you'll have to remind me. But let me start with the second. Um, I mean, you guys are actually, honestly, look at you, you're here. I mean, that's an incredible opportunity. I think it's really an incredible opportunity what you have. I never had that. So um, I think you have to take every opportunity. Don't miss to take advantage of any, any opportunity like this, like anything else that you are provided with. And just soak it in, soak it in, but give yourself the freedom to process it. Don't take, you know, you can take people's advices, but it's you who has to make the deep internal decision where you want to go and who you want to be. So I think it's the current gen, I want to be in high school, honestly, because there's so many opportunities. I can do all kinds of different things. It's just have an open mind, soak in everything, but take advantage of every opportunity. Ask questions, go after people, you know, get, get whatever you want, figure out what, who you want to, who can provide you the best, who has the best information for you, get it from them, you know. Don't and don't take no for an answer. Go for it, whatever it is that you're going for. What was the first question? <laughs> first question. What are the most valued skills in your line of work? The most um, communication. Communication by far. It isn't the technical skill. I mean, the technical skill is extraordinarily important. By communication, um, being able to convey your ideas to people who will fund your research or people who will, I don't know, uh, give you other opportunities, being able to, to convey that idea, being able to say it in a like lay and very understandable way, but also in an exciting way. So to me, communication is extraordinarily important. Um, I really focus a lot. You can see I can sit here and talk and I'm, um, you know, I gave the oration, you know, I like public speaking and I believe that I've said that numerous times as well, that I believe that our duty as a scientist, engineer, as technologist is to bring our innovation, our discoveries, our scientific findings to the general public, because otherwise it cannot be appreciated. How would they? How would the society appreciate, take notice of us, or implement stuff at, at a broad scale? They need to have the knowledge, appreciation of that. So public speaking for me to audiences like you or others is very important. So I'm just ending with the same thing: communication. Communication, one of those soft skills that there's likely no one subject on, but it's very handy. Well, it has to be linked to the hard skills, you know, you cannot have just hard skill because you're going to be doing your hard skill, you know, in the little corner, but you want the rest of the world to know how fabulous your corner is, right? You guys have to convey that to someone. We've got a question here around the role of hard work and the role of lucky breaks in ending up where you've ended up. I know there's a phrase, how do people or the successful people create their own luck? And I'm wondering, how do you create your own luck? Oh, you can see my, I didn't have that much luck, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to start with. It was pretty hard road. Um, and so, but it is true that when I sort of um, got to Hopkins, and it wasn't just getting there, it was all creating all these networks and, and making people believe in what I do. And then it becomes easier. It is true. There is a there is a snowball effect. So if you look at my career as a curve over time, it was like ah, nothing happening. And then it went like that. And so when in this part, when you get here, it becomes easier to be successful because I get better students. I get an amazing, amazing group of people, you know, to be my, everybody wants to be in my lab. And so and particularly people who are really devoted to bringing engineering in medicine. So I, I, I get that um, I get 
I get invited to things like this. Well, how awesome is that, right? How awesome is that to be able to be recognized for your achievements, to be able to speak about that and to inspire people? To me, inspiring people is probably one of the most exciting things in my life, you know? And so um, it, it does, but it, it, the luck brings luck, but it is, it is now, um, as I said, it takes a long time to get to that point where you can can have that expression. I see, I see. Um, a few people would like to know who is it that supported you throughout throughout your career, and maybe more broadly, what does good support look like? Yeah, <laughs> the gut. <laughs> you know, it's not too much. I didn't have. I didn't have any mentors. I didn't have. Really, I have relied immensely on myself. Um, you know, I have. To, I'm very grateful to my partner. My husband, by the way, grew up in Melbourne. Um, he came here at age of twelve and went to Monash. He was here. He's an economist. He went to Monash. He was here for seventeen years. Yes. And when I met him at Duke University, you know, the first thing was like the best city in the world is Melbourne, and I'm returning to it. And uh, um, well, he lives with me now, but <laughs> he's always living. But um, you know, um, uh, he's been very supportive. He, he, it's, it's, you know, it is one of these. We one of these families in which, I mean, I, it sounds ridiculous, but I'm the more whatever, the more known, if you will. I'm the one who does more, has more visibility, and and has been recognized for success and something like that and he's been with me you know um he's been very supportive of that and very he's very good at helping me sometimes when you have a problem political problem at the university or some other to help me navigate or i bounce off like i don't want to be harsh you have to be political how to be I'm not great at that i learned to be much better so he's been great at that helping me but just being there if you you know so that's I acknowledge that it is probably the me to me the rest is like I really didn't have any any mentor or anybody to rely on and my students oh my god my lab they like my children I mean really I have an incredible relationship with uh, the students in my lab incredible they love partying with me so let's <laughs> let's put it that they come want to come to my house and have a lab party all the time and the the problem is they live at 4 a.m. This is like, oh my God, where are they going to live? No, they're hanging out at 4 a.m. So they just like, I like the social atmosphere with them. I like, you know, it's very friendly. That's extremely helpful. That's been incredible for me. You've got me grinning ear to ear the way you speak about the people you work with. Um, another question, what's been your favorite part of working with and in the clinic from the perspective of an engineer? The, my my most favorite part is when we were in the clinic and when they treat the patient by the simulations that we have executed and we tell where to treat and then you know the you can see so there is a, a glass wall and the patient is there in the tables i mean sedated completely and there is a big screen and there is a big machine and a catheter that gets navigated to where we predict and you're seeing like all that on the screen and then the clinician turns to me or to my students and go, okay, I burn, yeah. And so it's your responsibility. You are the person who, who, who is treating. And that, oh my God, that's such a, it's exhilarating, but it's also like, you know, I felt so heavy, like that you take this responsibility as well. So that's, and it's very important for the students. They love coming to the procedures. Um, you know, they, they had a procedure without me there so that's a really great part when you not just develop like an artificial intelligence tool that can be used and you know it predicts but you don't see directly this is where you see directly the the effects of um, of your work and how do you become comfortable and confident enough to speak in front of big crowds i mean it goes from the fact communication how am i going to convey to you where i come from what i do and you know what why it's it's actually awesome to speak to crowds because i get your energy if you you know like when i gave the oration the other day it's really big 
big room and I'm standing there and I'm talking. And when I talk, I look at people's faces. I look at them. None of them are, are looking at their phone. Okay, that's very important. If they, so you have to speak in such a way that they don't want to be looking at their phones. They're looking at you. And it's great. I can talk to people. I feel like I'm almost, almost talking to somebody personally. This developing this feeling and this sort of, I like it. I love that. I love, I love bringing the message to everybody. So it's also part of your personal preference who you want to be, you know. So to me, that's an important part of my life. And I'm sure we all appreciate it very much getting to hear you speak. A few people have asked, do you have a favorite country that you've traveled through or worked in? Oh, um, I've, so I love travel, love, love travel. I've been to so, so many countries. I really love travel, but um, I have two countries that I love most based on the food or nothing else <laughs> so food is important part of life so i love japan and italy are two most favorite destinations for me in terms of food um, the rest every country it's i love learning about the local cu culture i love interacting with people i travel for me is it's actually a very important part of my job and it's a very happy part you know many people hate traveling you know for work I don't mind. I not on, only that I don't mind. I I actually like that. I like the experiences. I like the novelty of the ex, of the interactions. It's it's awesome for me. I couldn't agree more. Food is very important <laughs> for everyone. Uh, what do you think the role is of universities at the moment? How do they fit into the broader picture? Oh, they educate the next generation of leaders, innovators, pioneers. It's it's extraordinary role in society. It's like the most important role to, to, to educate. Education is what our society does for tomorrow. So that's, that's no, I mean, to me, it's very important. We've only got a few minutes left. Uh, I'm going to squeeze in two more questions. When will we learn, oh sorry, when will you learn the results of the randomized blind clinic study and do you publish these findings? Um, so the, the clinical trial is 160 patients and we've enrolled 23. Um, I can't, don't have a date for it, but it depends on the patient enrollment. During COVID, we had to stop. We, we had just started enrolling patients and we had to stop because they don't have space in the hospital for clinical research and also electric elective procedures were not done so we were delayed by because of that right now we do about three patients a month but sometimes i was explaining that today you think you're doing three patients a month but the one patient comes and the guy is claustrophobic so you cannot stick them in the mri so then they keep falls out of the clinical right then another guy comes and falls asleep in the scanner they are they are coached how to breathe they fall asleep in the scanner and then you can scan you know like so it's getting a good scan is really important. So you gotta, you gotta coach them. And so how all the, you know, you may plan whenever to finish it. What what happens is very much depends on what happens when they come to the clinic. And what was your hardest time in school? In school, I don't remember that because I decided to erase it off my memory. <laughs> That's the path forward. I erase these memories. I think I didn't know who I was. Isn't that that? That's a very difficult. I, I, I think I didn't know who I was. I mean, what did I want? What I did appreciate? So I look back and I'm like, oh my God, oh, how did I go through these years? <laughs> but you know, so ability to learn who, who you are to figure out, like ask yourself, what do I want? What excites me? It's so important. You, you know, you can be shy about that. It's who you are, recognizing who you are and expressing that is very important. Can I ask, at what point did you figure out who you were and what it was that excited you? Um, Maybe you're still going. Yeah, and, um, well, I, I thought I figured it out, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, probably, um, probably when I was in early in my academic career that I very sort of hold on it so probably yeah around that time i fully knew i knew before but not completely but i think yeah and finally somebody would just like to compliment your haircut <laughs> i love 
fashion. <laughs> fashion is my, like, I love fashion, design. This is it. If I wasn't a professor of biomedical engineering in another life, I might have been in fashion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And very sadly, that brings us to the end. Um, but I say a huge thank you once again for coming and speaking with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that.